OK, this evening um, we're going to take a fairly quick uh, look at uh, a history of Israel and the Jews. Just to give you a little bit of background, as some of you know, I work in a school um, and I had a large number of conversations with people in the autumn um, who were asking me questions that maybe I didn't have quite have the answers. I came to the Lord in 1980. In 1981, I, bu- I met some Christians who introduced me to the fact that God hadn't finished with Israel. Um, and I've read most of the books going on that subject, but I realized that to some extent I didn't have some of the answers that I needed to deal with some of the questions that were coming. And what I'm going to say is there's a lot missed out, so please do not say to me, you have missed out my favorite passage tonight, um, otherwise we won't go to bed till tomorrow. So we'll, we'll try, and it's going to be fairly fair. Can I just recommend, if you want some reading, um, some of the classic books I've listed up there, a um, couple by a gentleman by the name of Ken Burnett. Nigel and I were privileged to run a Bible week with Ken as part of the leadership team a number of years ago. We had Lance Lambert to speak, both at the church we attend in Reading, and uh, he came to the camp on one occasion. Uh, he's got a couple of books there. There's uh, David Pawson has written a really good book, and that was entitled Israel in the New Testament. There's a couple by a particularly interesting speaker called Derek Prince. He writes wonderful books. Many of you may have read some of his books. I recommend those two, The Key to the Middle East and Why Israel. And there's one I've got in the middle that I've just come across, a gentleman by the name of Philip Davis. One of his books is on the table there for purchase. But it would say, if not, go online and buy that one, The Miracle That Is Israel. It's a fabulous book, extremely well written, and it's very easy to read, and probably one you ought to have on your coffee table. So when people come round, they sort of, you know, while you're in the kitchen, you can make sure that one's on the top of the pile if they're not into Israel, because that is a fabulous book to read. So... I just thought I'd pick up on some of the questions, some of the bits and pieces. Hopefully we'll answer these this evening. I mean, we've all heard about that statement, and I challenged somebody at uh, at work was talking about the river and the sea, and asked them the question, and they said, well, which river and which sea are you talking about? I don't know. I said, well, that's not much good, you joining in with thousands of other people if you don't know what it means. Um, Another one I've heard, Jesus was a Palestinian. Here's the classic one. The Jews have only been in Israel since 1948. Somebody said that one to me. Uh, Jews only existed after 1948. And then when I asked them a little bit more, they said, well, maybe after the 1930s. (laughs) I'm serious, folks. These are intelligent people, and this is what they are saying. You know, after a bit of correction, yeah, well, the Jews exist. I suppose they must have existed in 1930. Otherwise, 30s, otherwise Hitler wouldn't have tried to get rid of them. So there we go. But So let's start with the first one, and that is, what about that term Jew? Well, obviously, as far as everybody is concerned, the term Jew, Israelites, Hebrews, children of Israel, Jews, all interchangeable, but where does it come from? Um, and I've asked people and said, well, where do you think the, the term Jew comes from? And somebody says, oh, we don't know. And then I point out to them, I actually grew up in the second largest Jewish community in Europe when I was, when I was a child. And when we had Jewish holidays, there were only eight of us left in the primary school. I was in a year group that had four classes of 40. It was when you went into the class, those in the back row sat down, pulled your desk towards you, and you were there for the next hour, and then the next group, and the next lot, and the next lot. Okay, so there were three years. Each group had about 120 in the year group or 160 in the year group. So you can work it out. And there were eight of us left on Jewish holidays. A lot of my friends, so sometimes on a Sunday, I'd meet them and I'd see them and I'd turn left and go to church and they'd go back to shul. You know, this was the sort of, you know, walking through the streets. This was the sort of background. So where does that term Jew come from? It comes from the the word Yehudi, which comes from the tribe of Judah, and those who were resident in that area, and later on we'll look at some maps. So it was basically used in anybody who lived in the area of what was ascribed to the tribe of Judah after about 500 BC. Okay, that is Jew, that is Arab, that is anybody else who lived in the area was basically referred to as a Jew. So any Arabs who come from the sort of southern Israel area were in those days would have been called a Jew or Yehudi, to put it actually correctly. 
And as I was doing a little bit more, okay, I just thought I'd bring up the, the flag. Okay, the, the flag, which of course the, the flag for the Latian. Anybody know where it comes from? Well, actually, when they were looking to have the first Zionist conference, they decided that they would hang a prayer shawl up. And of course, the prayer shawls, as you probably know, have, have blue tassels around the side. But that's incredibly difficult and expensive to manufacture when it comes to making flags, as you can imagine. So what they did was that they actually just put two blue stripes down the side of the flag. And then they came up with the Star of David. Well, we look at that and we think about it, but it's actually got significance. Because if you look at it, we've got two arrows, one pointing to heaven and one pointing to earth, looking about the link between the divine and the physical for the children of Israel. Also, if you actually look, that there are 12 lines make up the Star of David, and of course that represents the 12 tribes with God in the middle. And if you want to actually sort of take it a little bit further, and you actually look at that, you will actually find that there are actually six triangles around the outside, talking about the fact that it talks back to creation. Because on six days, God created the seven and the earth, and on the seventh day in the middle is God himself. And it's interesting that the two blue lines re actually are generally considered to refer to two rivers. But not the two rivers that they're talking about in London today. You may have seen there was a large march in London again. We're actually referring to, of course, the rivers of the Euphrates and the Nile. That, because those were the land that was promised to Abraham. So I just thought I'd give that as a little intro as I was doing some research and I'd throw that in so that, you know, if people ask you questions, you can, you can put that in. So let's actually turn into God's Word. And what I've done is to give us, we're going to go back to about 2100 BC, so we've got about 3000 years to cover in the next half an hour. What I would say is there's a lot I've left out, um, and if you want to find the rest of the detail, a lot of it I actually recorded this at home. And I put together two videos which actually contain a lot of the other details. So let's, let's put some spiritual roots now. Because what's going on, the battles that are going on across the world are spiritual. And unless we look at it from a spiritual viewpoint, we will never ever understand what, what is going on in, in the Middle East. So let's pitch in in Genesis chapter 12. And it says in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out from your country and your family and your father's house and go to a land I will show you. That is the call of Abraham. And it says in verse 2, it says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. That is a promise to Abraham that he would be a great nation. Here is Abraham. If you look, if you look back at that, Abraham was actually living... In Babylon, in Ba'ur of the Chaldees, right the way down the bottom of the Euphrates River at that time, when God called him and said to him, go somewhere else, because I'm going to make you a great nation. And in verse 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. That is a warning to us. We have a choice. We can either bless the children of Israel... Or if we don't bless them, then the God's word says we are cursing them. And look what God says. It says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we'll have a look at that later on. Because today we are blessed because of the children of Israel and what God's done. And has God fulfilled his word? Yes. Well, are we all blessed because of them? Yes, we are. And I'll show you some bits and pieces later on. And in verse 4, it says, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So Abraham was obedient, and as a result of that, God blessed him. And let's continue reading through the chapter, and it says the following. And it said, Then Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot's brother, and his son, and their possessions that they had gathered, and the people they had acquired in Haran. That was, if you look through, and if you want all the detail, actually if you go back to one of the sessions from the camp we had in the summer, I actually went through that in a lot of detail. So, let's, so if you want some more, you can go back and see all those bits and pieces. And it said, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then living in the land. And it said, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, 
to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent from Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. That is the first place in the Bible where people are calling on the name of the Lord. And it says, so Abraham journeyed going, going on still towards the south. And so what we find is that if we actually jump forward about 100 years to Genesis 15, and it says, on the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants I have given you this land from, note, the river Euphrates, the great river, the river Euphrates, from the river of Egypt, sorry, that's the Nile, the Nile right over here, following down that particular line there, right the way through to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kezidites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephilim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. What I, what I wanted to make there was never, Abraham never actually lived in the whole of the land. So some people are arguing, well, Abraham never lived in the land, so why bother about it? Well, you have to remember is what was this? Pro what was the covenant promise to? It wasn't just to Abraham, but to his descendants. And that's the piece a lot of people miss out. They say, "Oh, yeah, we know about Abraham, but he never lived. He can't, you know. It only talks about him living in part of the land, but it actually says the whole of that land is to be the inheritance of the children of Israel." So here we go. This is just another map that I found. So that actually covers it and gives you all the countries today that God actually said would become the possession of the children of Israel. And if we look at that from human terms, we're going, what? How on ever are they ever going to get that lot? But what do we believe in? We believe in an impossible God who can do far abundantly we can ever ask or think. So the question then becomes, well, let's have a look because we actually have, we have Abraham and he had two sons. And if we avoid that question, we will never fully understand the Middle East. So let's have a look at what God actually said and in Genesis chapter 15. Because if we understand what God said about Ishmael, then we stand a chance of understanding what's going on today. And if we don't, then we are missing completely. We will never understand the conflict that there is in the Middle East today. And Genesis 15, and I'm only picking particular verses, it says, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, that was to Abraham. It says, This one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body will be your heir. He was asking God about somebody who was living in his household. Okay, If you want to look at that, go back and have a look at the beginning of Genesis 15. I haven't got time to explain it all this evening. But he said the following, he said, Then brought him outside and said, Now look towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. We happen to live in a village where we don't have any street lights. And some people go, Oh, we must hate that. No, it's wonderful. Because we can go out and you can look up and you can see the stars. Because there's no street lights. And it reminds us about God's faithfulness. Because he said to Abraham that as many as stars as you can see, that will be your descendants. And if we jump on to chapter 16, we find that... Um, hang on, I've lost my notes. Yes. But you see, God had promised Abraham a descendant. And you see, if you remember, Abraham tried to make it happen through his his uh, concubine Hagar jumping on to Genesis 16 it says the following in verse 11 and the angel of the Lord appeared to her that is Hagar behold you are with child and you should bear a son and you should call his name Ishmael which means God will hear because the Lord has heard your affliction and this is look what God said about Ishmael it says he shall be a wild man and he shall be against every man, and every man's hand shall be against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. Know what it says there? It said, he shall be against every man, and every man's hand shall be against him. Isn't that the case with the Arabs today? You know, God said that all those years ago, that he said 
that he would be against every man and every man's hand will be against him. And when I show you some other bits and pieces later on, you'll see exactly that that word is fulfilled to this very day. And if we jump on again to Genesis 17, God says the following. He says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful. Who's got the oil? Who has the oil today? It's the Arab nations have the majority of the oil in the world. God said he will make him fruitful. And I will multiply him exceedingly and he shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. In verse 21, there is a word here that is, that is very important for our understanding. It says, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. You see, it's actually all about the fact that Ishmael said he will be blessed. But you see, govern, God's covenant was going to be with Isaac, with the children of Israel. And you see, this is the big issue, and has always been the issue, is the Ishmaelites wanted to be children of the covenant. They want their father's approval, but what happened? They have never had it. And to this day, they are trying to destroy the children of the covenant so that actually they can try and get the blessing. But you see, they will never, ever have their father's blessing because God said the covenant is not with them. He made all sorts of promises. But if we see that, if we take off our, our physical eyes and look with spiritual eyes, you will see that all the time, this is what they want. They think that if they can get rid of God's ch chosen people, they will have God's approval. But that's never going to happen, because that's what God said. But look what he said. It says in Genesis 21, he said, Yet I will also make a nation out of the children or the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. You see, God said he would make a, na a nation out of them. It said, Arise and lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. So God was with the lad, and he grew, and he dwelt in the wilderness. And it says, there's this little verse, and it says, He became an archer. What does that mean? It said he was going to become a man of war. A man of conflict. An archer is also one who hunts in those days for things that were not his. You see, this little phrase, I think we quite often miss it, don't we? That tells you the characteristics of the Arab people. And you see, it then says, it says, He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And he was therefore actually married to a wife who came from the nation of, from Egypt. And if we jump on to Genesis 25, it says the following, because that actually gives us another little bit about what's going on. It says, and these were the days of the years of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last, last and died and was gathered to his people. That phrase, gathered to his people, appears in numerous places in the Bible. It simply means that he died... Okay, and he, li and he died among his own people, not in a foreign land. But look what it says. It says, They dwelt from Haviar as far as Shur, which is the east of Egypt, as you go towards Assyria, and he died in the presence of his, his brethren. That actually, when we look at it, that is basically Saudi Arabia today. Isn't that interesting? That actually the Arab people, the Ishmaelites, lived in that area that today we call Saudi Arabia. And you see, he had a good life. So let's actually jump on a little bit more in the history of Israel. And let's jump on to 1400 BC. And let's see what happens. We've, we've, we've missed the bits about Egypt and Moses and the wilderness. So let's jump on to Joshua chapter 1 and some verses from there. In, Genesis, in Joshua chapter 1, it says the following, And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying... Remember the word of the Lord, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and giving you this land. Your wives and your little ones and your livestock shall remain in the land, which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. So where were they when this was being said to them? They were on the east side of the Jordan River. 
But you shall pass before your brethren armed with your mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving you to them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Okay, so there we have, that is actually where the tribes of Israel established themselves at about, as I said there, about the map says something different, but uh, the, let's say about 1400 to 1200 BC. But you can see where all of the tribes occupied in the land of Israel. But can I say to you, they didn't occupy one place. And I don't know whether you can see it, but there's this little place on the left-hand side here called Philistia, better known today as Gaza. We'll come back to that in a little bit later on. So if we now jump forward in a few more years, if we jump forward to the time of 1 Kings 12, we could spend a lot of time going through that. But Israel, basically a lot of the tribes got together and they formed two kingdoms. Okay, so we have Jeroboam, who was the first king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And we have actually Rehoboam, who was the first king of Judah, in the bottom kingdom down the bottom. Okay, and very clearly you will note there are places today where the tribes of Israel did not live. Okay, quite interesting. So let's jump on and let's look at some more bits and pieces. So let's look at a quick, quick history. Well, before we actually do that on my notes, just notice that where we have Philistia, that's where the Philistines lived. And these were the people who Goliath came from. And if you remember, they were from the giants of old and they were a very evil people, interestingly enough. Go away, do some research, and you can have a look at that. So we then come to what I've summarized here is a very quick history, and we're going to pick up on some of those bits and pieces in a minute. But you see, at about 2000 BC, we have the Abrahamic Covenant. We have in about 586 BD, BC, Judah was conquered by the Babylonians because Israel had already been taken by the Assyrians. Those who lived in the land were various groups. We had the Persians, we have the Greeks, we have the Romans, we have the Byzantines, we had the Arabs, we then had the Catholic Crusaders, we then had the Mamelukes, we then had the Ottomans, and then we had the British Empire. My question is, and I always say to people, when we've had a conversation about the river and the sea, I say, well, okay, which land, which group of people are you going to give the land back to? Huh? Can't answer the question. Because all of those groups of people have actually taken possession of the land at various points in time. And I jokingly said the other day, well, why don't you give it back to the British? That didn't go down too well. Maybe that was not a good idea. But you see, we have to, that nobody is thinking about what they're saying. But for we as Christians, we need to be armed because with information which will therefore allow us to be able to be in conversation with the people whom we actually encounter. So there I've got a couple of maps there, and those are from Jesus' time. Some of the places will be fairly familiar. The left-hand map there is actually shows you what the, the land of Israel, fairly well united under Herod the Great, you'll notice that there is a significant amount of was counted of Israel, which is east of the River Jordan, was counted in the land of Israel. And the one on the right is just taken a New Testament, which gives us some of the names. But you will see a lot of those names, as you've even mentioned in the Bible, Decapolis, we may have seen that one, okay, Perea, you'll find that one, all of those sorts of places. Not only have we got to the west of the River Jordan, We've got places that Jesus would have been familiar with to the, the east of the River Jordan. So where does the name Palestine come from? Well, let's jump on to a little bit here, to a, a, the date of AD 136 or 135, which is when Hadrian, we may know Hadrian's famous for a wall in Scotland, when he tried to keep the wild Scots away, he was actually emperor of Rome, 
and he had there was a little uprising on the far end of his sort of uh, empire you know this little red bit down here there was a bit of an uprising by the Jewish people the Jews who were living in the land note that were Jews living in the land in AD 3135 despite what some people would say and what he did was he actually introduced the term Palestina as naming the land because the Philistines were still living around and it was considered an insult to the Jews to call them Palestinians. So it was introduced and it was the way they named, he named the Jewish people and everybody else who lived in that region. So you've got the Jews, the Arabs and the Romans who hadn't gone home. So if you lived in the area there in about 183135, you were called a Palestinian. And the term, as I said, comes as it's an insult to the people who were living in the land. So although people today bander it around, it's actually an insult to the people. So then we start to work our way through, and I'm going to fly through quite a few maps just to help you. Um, as I said, if you want to slightly look, you can, all of these you can find them, just look them up. They're all available. So here we have that, in fact... In about 1884 to about 1919, this is the last major division which you can find. This was when the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turks, divided up the land and gave it to the, some areas to their friends. So the Turks occupied all of that land there with various people responsible. I don't intend to pronounce the names, but we've still got Egypt down here. You can see various other places. But there, in that day, that was what they considered to be the extent of what was basically the land of Palestine. You may be able to see it, but there's actually the, there's a line to the right. It's actually a railway line that was there that ran north to south through that, but at the land at that particular time. So here is a little summary before we look in detail at when actually the British were in charge of the land. 1917, we have the Balfour Declaration. We then have the British Mandate for Palestine, and we'll just pick up that again in a minute. We basically, in 1939, and this is something our nation, I'm, I, where, of course, we, horrific happened in 1939, when under the British Mandate, we banned Jewish people from escaping Europe to go to Israel. The ships were turned round and sent back. They were refused the permission to land anywhere down that Mediterranean coast. We, as a people, need to repent of that because a lot of Jewish people were sent back into Europe as a result. We've obviously got the World War II and the Holocaust in Europe. In 1944, there was something called the Jewish Brigade was allowed to become into the British Army. And therefore, in 1947, the UN proposed the Arab and Jewish state, and we'll have a look at that in some detail in a minute. So therefore, we have in 1917, we have what was called the Balfour Declaration, when basically the British government said that they recognised the right of the Jewish people to have a homeland of their own. I'm not going to go through the detail, but basically this was the UK government saying we are prepared to set up a Jewish homeland. And therefore, what happened was, in, that went on, and in 1922, they established what was called the British Mandate for Palestine. That was the area for the British Mandate. You remember the railway line that we talked about earlier on? You can see the railway line running down there. And basically, the whole of that area was going to be set up. Transjordan was, was set up. And basically, from that area of land, 75% was going to be given to the Arabs and Transjordan was set up and the Jewish national homeland was going to be set up with about 25% of the land. Okay, And that's what you actually find. It became, we had Palestine, which was to become Israel, and there on the left-hand side you've got the area of the land which was going to become the Jewish national homeland. The area on the right was going to be set up and called Transjordan. And Churchill actually did this, set this up, and notes that the border in this particular point has moved west from the railway line. Okay, the, so originally it was going to follow the railway line that when Churchill actually set up the Churchill's Declaration 
the railway line of the border actually moved to be in line with the river. Okay, and the Golan Heights were given to Syria at that particular point in time. We then find, as we move on through history, 1937, can I say I'm missing a lot out, but these are the key bits. We have what was called the Peel Commission, which is an attempt to actually get something established. The Peel Commission, can I say, was rejected before it was even printed. They said that the Arab people said they weren't going to recognise it because it left Jerusalem under British control. And if you look now, okay, can I say the blue area was going to be given to the Jewish state. The pinkish area was going to be Transjordan. You can see it's extended even further. And the, and the British were going to keep control of Jerusalem and a strip of land that actually went to, across to Jaffa to give access. It was rejected, but look, as I said, look at the land split when it actually comes to that. And it was, so then we move to the UN Resolution 181, okay, which was the partition plan for Palestine. You will notice that it's accepted that Jordan exists as a country. So we've already, we've already lost 25%, or 75% of the land. And you will see that under the, um, what was called UN Scope, or the UN Special Committee on Palestine, this was their recommendation, that the yellow area was given as more land for the Jewish people, and the sort of orangey-pink land was set up for the, um, the Jewish homeland, as they called it at that point in time. The Jewish... Pardon? Sorry, the, ye the yellow, sorry, the, the orange is for the Jewish state and the yellow was for the Arab state. I think, uh, that, there we go. Um, but it was accepted by the Jewish agency because they said, yes, we've got a homeland for the Jewish people, um, but rejected by the Arab higher committee again, as far as that was concerned. However, as we know, history that went forward, we actually found that on the... Uh, the Mitish Mandate ended on the 14th of May. The State of Israel was declared. And within several days, Israel was invaded by five Arab nations. You know, you've had a few days to get your army together, and yet five Arab nations actually invaded. That was Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. And an armistice arrangement was, took, was agreed, and Israel was admitted to the UN um, in the 4th of March in 1949, but Jerusalem was divided under Israeli and Jordanian um, rule. And these are the armistice lines that was actually set up. And you'll notice who was responsible for a little strip of land at the bottom. Gaza was actually occupied by the Egyptians and was put under Egyptian control. You've got the armistice lines, you've got Israel, and you've got this, suddenly this area called the West Bank appeared. And you'll actually see that actually if we look at it in a little more colour... There we go, there is, that was declared as being the green area, was as Transjordan. We've got the nation of Israel, the state of Israel. You've got this little demilitarized zone in one or two places, and you've got Gaza was actually set up um, under Egyptian control. And if we actually have a look at the northern border, okay, that was what the northern border looked like with a number of demilitarized zones. The reason for putting particularly the demilitarized zone in the bottom area was to make sure that actually um, fair water was allowed out of the Sea of Galilee because obviously whoever controls the sluice gates at the south of, of Galilee controls the water that's flowing down the Jordan Valley. And of course, that's significant for irrigation. Um, in the bottom area, in the southern area, there's one or two little bits of land movements around, but primarily we had this, and that's where the phrase the Gaza Strip came in. In 1950 was where that actually came in. And we can see the no man's land as far as that is concerned. So what we actually find then is that... Uh, and I've got my slides in the wrong order. Yes, I'm there. OK. I want to ask you a question before one to... Has anybody read the PLO document? I have. Yeah, one or two people have. Can I just... I just can I suggest it makes an interesting read... You can download it. It's available in Arabic and in English. But have a quick read, because what I want to do is, this is in 1964, and I want to read you... The, you know when... The, this is the PLO document, 
the document by which the Palestine Liberation Organization run today. Okay? These are the two articles which are the, the top of the document. There are then another 72 articles that talk about governance and all the rest. But if you read the top two, that will give you a feeling as to where we are today. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read them. I'm going to read them from in here. And it says, We, the Palestinian Arab people, who face the forces of evil and injustice and aggression against, from whom the forces of international Zionism and colonialism conspired and worked to displace it, dispossess it, dispossess it from its homeland... So that's their opening statement. This is what they're saying. You know, the, the, the Zionists have displaced the Arabs from their homeland. And their aim is to realise its freedom and dignity and who has determined to amass its forces and mobilise its efforts and capabilities in order to continue the struggle and move forward on the path of holy war until, until complete and final victory has been obtained. In other words, until all of the Zionists are out of the way. And it says, We, the Palestinian Arab people, depending upon our right of self-defense and complete restoration of our lost homeland to completely rid the world of Zionism and its peoples. Those are the founding two statements at the beginning of the PLO document, Covenant. Okay, that is their aim. So we need to understand that whenever anything is going on, that the PLO from 1964, particularly that second paragraph, that is one of their aims. It's there, you know, that is from the document. I cut and paste it from the PLO covenant. You know, it's nothing, you know, if you, anybody wants to check that out, you can check out the phrases and the words. So then we find that actually we've got, a, we've got one or two other little bits and pieces so the PLO was formed, and then in 1967, we had this, um, this six-day war. And if you remember, the Israel then occupied the Golan Heights, the West Bank, Gaza, and Sinai as part of that particular war, as a result of the six-day war. And what happened was that as a result of various negotiations, and I have looked at various UN documents, they're not the most exciting to read, but what actually happened was a lot, particularly Sinai was given back to Egypt. They actually didn't get Gaza back at that particular point in time, and we still argue about the West Bank. And then we have 1973, the Yom Kippur War, where Israel moved into Sinai to defend its um, southern border. And as you will know, if you read some detail, and there's a lot of detail about that in the uh, Philip Davis book, you will see that, that Israel again occupied the same lands that it had occupied before. And basically, it, Israel gained four times the amount of land that it had before the Yom Kippur War. But as you know, there have been various discussions on that front. And then we find, we actually get to, in um, 1982, there was a peace treaty agreed. Egypt got the Sinai back. Um, Israel retained Gaza and the West Bank. And we have, of course, the disputed Golan Heights, which makes quite interesting reading. So then we come to, how many of you have ever read this? Okay, the Hamas Covenant. Anybody read that one? This one makes in interesting reading. Okay, if anybody wants, uh, can I just say, it's downloadable. If anybody wants that, I can send you the PDF. It's, Talk to me afterwards and I'll send you a copy of this. But I just want to read this to you. Okay, this was the Islamic Resistance Movement, better known as Hamas, 18th of August 1988. First line of the covenant says, Israel and the, and the Jews will exist and will continue it to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it has obliterated others before it. That is the first line of Hamas's aims. Okay? And then it goes on to say various bits and pieces, and I'm looking at the clock, and I'm going to leave the net, those two out. Okay? And it talks about the Islamic resistance movement, and they want the banner of Allah over every inch of Palestine. Okay? Various bits and pieces. 
The bottom one is quite intricate. Article 7, I will read that one. It says, the exam Islamic resistance movement is one of the links in the chain of the struggle against the Zionist invaders. The Day of Judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing the Jews, when a Jew will hide behind stones and trees, and the stones and trees will say, O oh, Muslims, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. That's in their covenants. If we jump on, a lot of the articles are all about setting up organisations. But everybody says, oh, why can't we have these peace negotiations with, with Hamas? Because in Article 13, it says the following. It says, there is no solution for the Palestine question except through jihad. Initiatives, proposals and international conferences are all a waste of time and vain endeavours. So when they sit down around the table, Hamas are already saying, it's a waste of time. We're just doing it for a bit of lip service. Because in their covenant, they say they are a waste of time. And in Article 15, it says, the day that the enemies usurp a part of the Muslim land, jihad becomes an individual duty of every Muslim. So every Muslim across the world, it is their duty to rid the world of Jews. That is what the Hamas covenant is saying. And that's what the PLO covenant is actually saying. And I won't read this one here, but Article 32 goes on to actually... Re and it talks about the Islamic resistance movement consider itself to be the spearhead of the circle of struggle with world Zionism and a step on the road. Islamic groupings all over the Arab world, and wherever there are more than five Arabs, it's part of the, considered to be part of the Arab world should do the same since all of these are best equipped for the future role in the fight with the warmongering Jews. That is what I said. If you want to have a read, don't read it before bedtime. But that's, you know, that has been taken straight from the Hamas covenant. And I, I've picked various bits. Other people highlight other bits and pieces. But when we think about what's been going on, that is what is behind what's going on. So we jump forward to 1993, we have what's called the Oslo Accords, I vaguely remember that, you probably don't remember the detail of it, but the Oslo Accords were basically working on the principle that actually areas of Israel would be given to the Palestinian Authority for them to rule, and that the colour code basically says that they were going to start in the, in the areas which are brown, and then the authority would be extended to B, areas B, and then basically they would be given authority over the whole of basically Gaza and what they refer to as the West Bank. Okay, and that, they're, they're going to work this through, and that's what the Oslo Accords talked about in 1993. Um, we then have something called Camp David in 2000, which proposed again that the state, nation of, they call it the State of Palestine, again Gaza, the yellow bits and the blue bits were going to be annexed to Israel just to keep everybody happy in the hope that things would work. But as you know, that wasn't exactly agreed, and therefore the Camp David Agreement basically lasted about as long as it took to write somebody's name on it, if you remember. And we had one of the, the Intifada started the next day. Okay, we then had in 2005, and this one is quite critical, because in 2005 we have what's called the disengagement plan. This was, if some of you may remember, that, in, that we had Jewish settlements or Jewish areas in Gaza, and in 2005, all the Jewish people were forcibly removed from Gaza. You had no choice. If you were Jewish, you had to move. And if you refused to move, they basically put you in handcuffs, loaded all your stuff in a lorry, and drove them out. So Gaza became, that area of Gaza actually became totally no Jewish people living in the Gaza Strip, as it was there. There was the plan to move up one or two people out of the West Bank, but that, as you know, has never actually happened. But that was part of the agreement. But all of the people who were moved out of Gaza, the Jewish people who were moved out, were actually given free accommodation in the land. So let's jump on, and I just thought I've got some little ratios, and we're just on the home straight here. So we're sitting today where we've got 32 Arab, 22 Arab states and one, one Jewish homeland of a ratio of 22 to 1. The total population is uh, 440 million um, registered as Arabs. 
to a Jewish population of about 7.5 million. That's those living in the land. And if you think about the land areas, okay, there's about 5 million square miles of land which is, be, which is counted as current Arab nations. And the square miles of land for Israel is 0 0.009 million, to put it on the same scale. And I've got some, actually some ratios in there. So that then brings us to the final bits and pieces and that, is, and that is some questions to ask. And that is some questions that I found, and they do actually answer. To, and that is, I've asked people and said, do Jews have a right to a self-determination as a state? And if you, somebody says that and says no, then you can quite happily turn around and accuse them of being anti-Semitic. Does Israel have a right to exist? And I think a lot of people say yes, but not where it is. Will a two-state solution work? Ask somebody that question. I have yet to find somebody who will answer that question, yes or no. <laughs> the question is, and therefore one person said this to me, I said, well, okay, when they talk about giving land back, I asked the question, uh, should we give Alaska back to the Russians or the American indigenous Indians? Hmm, can't see that happening. But if you look at American history... Or how about giving California back to the Spanish? That's quite a good one. That's recent history when the Spanish were in charge of California. Or how about giving Transjordan back to, back to the Bedouins? Because they were displaced in 1922 when Transjordan was established. They all moved south into Saudi Arabia. So let's say we'll give Transjordan back to the, to the Saudis. Hmm, not quite sure that is going to happen. So some questions to ask. So as we come to the end of what I've got to share, how can we help? Well, one of the things is we can do is just by making sure we support Israel by what we say. My conversation since October has turned around and I try where I can and people to actually support Israel. I say buy Israeli products where we can. I must admit, I did have a look at the oranges in Asda this week. You know... Okay, so there weren't any Israeli Jaffa oranges, but where we can, we try and buy. Can I say, most of the kit which we use for live streaming here and in the church in Three Mile Cross and in other, I've got my own, most of it uses processor chips that were manufactured in Israel. I deliberately picked bits of kit where the electronics is made in Israel. And what I would say to you is, ask somebody a question if they have an Android phone, where was the processor made? Because most Android phones, although they are actually put together in China, most Android phones have the processor chip which is manufactured in Israel. So maybe that's an idea to move away from Apple or your iPhone, but there we go. But I buy Israeli products where we can. And if people are still being anti-Israel, anti, say to them, OK, how many of you have ever had a general anaesthetic? And people go, yes. I said, do you remember that white stuff that went up your arm? Profanol. Where is 90% of the world's profanol made? And they go, I don't know. Israel. If you're diabetic, where does most of the insulin come from? This is going to become a silly question in a minute. It comes from Israel. Where does a huge amount of the electronics that we have in our cars, where was it designed, even if it isn't manufactured? Israel. As I said, most of us drive cars that have an ignition system that is modelled on a Bosch ignition system, and Bosch were in development with Israel as far as that was concerned. If not, find out who the Nobel Prize winners are. We've got this lovely plant, which means you can't see, but there we go. The Nobel Prize winners, more Nobel Prize winners have come from, from Jewish people than from any other people group. Pick a few that you've actually armed yourself with. So let's give us a challenge. And I wouldn't be right if I didn't say, well, we need to make sure we know the God of Israel who sent Jesus to die that we might have eternal life. And where did Jesus learn? Where did he walk? Where did he talk? Where was he, where was he buried? Or where was he crucified? Where was he buried? Where did he rise from the dead? Are we full of the Holy Spirit and praying, praying as directed by God? 
Psalm 122 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem that they may prosper who love you. Can I say, if you have trouble sleeping, pray for Israel. Let me put it this way. If it's God who's woken you up, you'll continue praying and you'll be perfectly all right in the morning. And if it's Satan who's woken you up because he really doesn't want you to have a good night's sleep, start praying for Jerusalem and you still go back and you go back to sleep very quickly. That's my philosophy. May seem strange. May think I've got two heads, but it seems to have worked over the years. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, I am the Lord and I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, those sons of Jacob. Who are the sons of Jacob? They are the children of Israel. And let's go back to where we started in Genesis chapter 12. And it says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And therefore, if you want to be blessed, bless the children of Israel. Pray for Israel, and God will command a blessing in our lives as far as that is concerned. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that it is your desire that we should bless the nation of Israel and the children of Israel, that people of the covenant, Father. Father, we know that many of them don't own you today, but Father, we just continue to pray and to bless, pray for the peace of Jerusalem at this time. And Father, we just pray for ourselves. May we be an equipped people, equipped to be able to answer and give an account for that which we believe, and that, Father, you will just help us on a day-by-day basis to be the people in the places that you need us to be, that we can love and support your people, the nation of Israel. And we just ask all these things In Jesus' name, amen.